This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the AIPIS show for accredited income property investment specialists and those who aspire to be. If you're a real estate, mortgage, or financial professional, this is the place for you. We'll explore innovative investment analysis, sales, marketing, and income generating strategies for the most historically proven wealth creator, income property. Learn from the experts as they show you how to build a better business and a better life. Hey, I want to welcome back a returning guest that is our wonderful client and now friend of the show, Muthaya. A few months ago, I recommended uh, when Muthaya was having some problems that uh, he file a complaint against the seller and property manager of his property. And he did. And he got some justice. He got some recourse out of that. So very exciting. This is something I want to recommend to everybody listening. Be the empowered investor. Be an empowered investor. Be an empowered consumer. Do not be a victim. So there are ways you can hold people accountable without without having to go out and hire a lawyer and taking them to court and dealing with that whole mess because that is just a mess and it usually doesn't work. <laughs> so I hate to say, and I'm telling you that from my own experience, but you know, there are some other things you can do. We're here to talk about those today and, and remember something else before we dive into this. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Another old saying like that I used to hear from my Aunt Bernice is a stitch in time saves nine. A stitch in time saves nine. So, you know, that's another thing we're talking about today, right? And Muthai is going to share a couple of best practices. Uh, learned the hard way from mistakes he made that now, you know, he will never make those mistakes again. The real world University of Hard Knocks, School of Hard Knocks. And then we're going to talk about what you can do even if none of that works, the prevention doesn't work. Okay, so so Muthaya, welcome and thank you for sharing your story with all our listeners. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. So what happened? I bought a couple of properties in Alabama and uh, one of those properties that I bought turned out to be a big disaster. The property had a pool. I never owned a property with a pool. This one had a pool and that brought some problems along with it. One of the mistakes I made, and I hope others will learn from this, is to make sure that you conduct a home inspection. When, I'm, when I say home inspection, or home inspection of the entire property. I mean, not just the home. In my case, I did not inspect the pool, which turned out to be a problem later on. There were some problems with the liner of the pool and so on. So it's important to make sure that you get a complete inspection. And after the inspection is done and the seller has done the repairs, you need to send the inspector back to go back and re-inspect it to make sure that the uh, absolutely the yeah. were in fact done. That is a good best practice. So two things there that we're saying, just let me make sure everybody caught those. Number one, generally speaking, try to avoid properties with pools. It's not a hard and fast rule. They certainly can be more desirable. So, you know, for the hassle and aggravation of this whole extra system and potential piece of liability, of course, it could be worth it if it pays for itself and then some, but most properties won't have a pool. Okay. But you know, here and there, you'll see one with a pool that makes sense as a good rental property. Okay. So I'm not saying yes or no, I'm saying mostly no, but you know, not completely. So the first thing is if you have a pool, remember, in addition to your normal home inspection, you must also have a pool inspection. And that is going to be almost for sure that it's going to be a completely different inspector that specializes in pools and pool systems. So have a pool inspection. The other thing is when you have, because you must always have a home inspection, when you have that home inspection, there will almost always be punch list items, you know, and you can decide as the empowered investor and the buyer yourself, but if they're, you know, just minor little items, you can just let them go and trust that the seller is going to take care of them. If not, though, you must have a re-inspection. You have to pay an extra fee to have the home inspector go back to re-inspect the property 
and make sure that all of those repair items are done before you close on the property, okay? And if they are not done, do not take a promissory note from the seller that says they'll do them later. The only thing I would accept is money held in escrow. In other words, part of the seller's proceeds held in escrow if they somehow, for some reason, can't get those repairs done before closing, then the closing attorney, the escrow, the title company, they withhold part of the seller's proceeds that requires a mutual instruction or at least your signature before those funds can be released and make sure those funds are adequate. So for example, if they say, well, you know, the property needs a new water heater, right? And, you know, say you determine that a water heater is going to cost, I don't know, 700 bucks, right? Then, you know, you withhold 700 at least, you know, maybe a little, probably some extra, okay, because you never know what else you might discover. So if they agree to withhold $1,000 after the closing of the deal, and you control that money that, you know, can't get released to them until it's fixed, then you're going to be okay. That's your insurance, okay? But don't just accept a note with no money behind it. You know, show me the money, as Jerry Maguire says, okay? So, uh, Muthaya, okay, go ahead. That was the very first thing. You know, the, the next key point for me was, this is something that's always, you know, ever since I started buying property through the network, it's been something that I've had success and problems with the property management company. You know, I mean, all these property management companies have the standard contract that they have you signed, you know, I think it's important to read that properly. And so you know what you're getting into. I think it's also important to have a good relationship with the property management company. And I know it's a good idea to go with the company that the seller recommends, but I think that they have a beneficial interest. And so I would just shop around if you have time to look at other property management companies. But you need to work with somebody you're comfortable with because they could make it very difficult for you going forward by not crediting your accounting time, not communicating with you properly. There's a lot of things. And, you know, and, and Jason, quite honestly, over the last two years, this is just my opinion. I could be wrong, but this is based on my experience. So the bigger the company is, the more layers there are in the company, and it's very hard to deal with them. And you can get lost in the shuffle. I, I mean, I've got properties with companies that manage thousands and thousands of yeah. properties, and they're just too many layers. Okay, okay. So more bureaucracy, right? So there's a trade-off for that. And I'm not sure which is best. There's sort of two kinds of companies in the world if on each end of the spectrum. There's the big company that supposedly, supposedly, <laughs> okay, has really good systems. You know, they've invested more money in technology and software, and they've got protocols and got business processes, hopefully, that are more established, right? But they've got more bureaucracy, right? So that's the big company concept. It's good and bad, okay? On the other side of the spectrum, there's the small company that is, you know, kind of winging it, okay, <laughs> in some ways, but <laughs> but they're hungry. I mean, in theory, they're hungry, and they're really going to just give you a great service, right, to try and make a name for themselves and, and try and get bigger, right? You know, that's what every entrepreneur wants is to be bigger, right? And so it's kind of two ends of the spectrum. And, you know, the experience is, Mothiah, they can go either way with either one. You right. know, the small guy, it's sort of not as efficient in a lot of ways. Usually the solopreneur or the small office with three people you know, versus the big company with 30 people. You know, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. Right. It just all depends, you know. Right. Now, Jason, you know, what I was trying to say was, look, I think it's important to make your expectations very clear to the property management company from the very beginning. Right. So they know you're not just passively sitting back and and then accepting whatever it is that they credit your account. If they deduct $500 or $300, you don't know why they're deducting it. You need to question these things, you know. Yeah. You need to question. You need to look yeah, at your statement. You need to look at your owner's portal and, hey, why, why did you do that? You know, why Why is this my uh, responsibility, not the tenant's responsibility? Sure. And, you know, those are questions yeah. I think it's important for investors to ask the property management company so the next time they know that, hey, you know, maybe we should be more careful with more yeah. buyers. <laughs> Let me mention a few things here. So first off, I don't want any of you listening to be the easy customer. I don't want you to be a pushover, okay? You know who you are. 
On the other end of the spectrum, if you're a pain in the ass, I don't want you to be too much of a pain in the ass either, okay? <laughs> because, you are you know, it's like neither of those people gets very far in life, right? The difficult person, nobody wants to work with them. And they'll just put up their hands and say, go somewhere else, right? The pushover gets taken advantage of all the time. So I think the answer is somewhere in the middle, right? You know, I would... If there's a continuum between the totally difficult, impossible client and the pushover, everybody listening, when it comes to dealing with property managers, I want you to be 65, 60, 65% toward the more difficult person. I want you to be an aware, empowered investor. But here's the thing. You can have high expectations without being a jerk, okay? Being a jerk just won't get you anywhere in life, okay? You know, that always backfires. You know, there's, it just doesn't work, okay? But you can still have good expectations and high expectations. When you were talking about the contract, Mathia, and the importance of reading it, the importance is way more than reading it. Reading it is the first step. The second part is negotiating it. So just because the, con hopefully you read it, so thank you for saying that. A lot of people don't even read this stuff, okay? The thing I want you to negotiate, folks, is I want you to negotiate the latitude, and this is not new information, I've said it on the last, you know, 900 and something episodes, okay? But negotiate the latitude the property manager has to charge you for stuff. So again, they will have these standard clauses in those contracts, and they need them, okay? But just how much, to what degree do they need them is the question. So the clause will say, in case of an emergency, in other words, a pipe is breaking, you know, pipe broke and there's water leaking everywhere. You know, the property manager has the right and you want them to have the right to go over and stop the leak, to stop further damage, right? Okay. But then the next thing will be those sort of optional repairs. The tenant calls and complains about something stupid, like I saw an ant on the kitchen counter or the light bulb burnt out, you know? No, you don't do <laughs> No, this stuff's ridiculous. This is ridiculous stuff, right? And I want you to look at that clause the way it's written very carefully, okay? The discretionary spending clause, where it says the property manager has the right to determine at their discretion up to $200 per incident of money that they can deduct from your, your check, okay? The funny thing is, Muthaya, when it comes to, like, my mom has been on the show several times, and you've heard her and commented about her. You know, she self-manages. She's like an extreme do-it-yourselfer, and I, I really am starting to be a real believer in self-management. But she doesn't spend hardly any money on her property. Some of these property managers, they're just giving away your money. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And you got to stop them from doing that. Do not be a pushover, okay? Just say, this clause... I'm going to limit it to a per month amount, not a per incident amount. First off, there's a difference between per incident and per month. So the tenant could call twice in one month and say, hey, well, today the garbage disposal is broken. And then, you know, next week, this other thing's broken, right? And suddenly, if the property manager can deduct $200 per incident, you lost $400, you just got to eliminate that discretion. It's not necessary. The duty, though, on you, the investor, is that you have to be available and communicative and responsive, okay? So if that tenant calls about something and says this or that is broken and needs to be fixed, first of all, know what you're actually obligated to do, okay? You're not obligated to do everything, you know, the tenant has some responsibilities too, okay? So that's the number one thing. And then the number two thing is you must communicate and approve or deny requests quickly. Otherwise, the manager is going to say, hey, we need discretion because I couldn't reach you for two weeks. And by then, the tenant's really unhappy, right? But the bottom line is I'd really recommend people consider self-managing. It's much easier than you think. Uh, and we've done a lot of shows on that over the years. Anyway, so... Per incident and per month. I want you to make it a per month limit of no more than $200. Ideally, less. So don't just read your contract. Negotiate your contract with your property manager. Or 
just self-manage and you can take them out of the equation completely. Muthaya, go ahead. Right. Look, just let me play the devil's advocate for just a second. You know, property managers that manage hundreds of properties, they have this standard contract and, That's you know, exactly they have what they're going to say, yeah. In spite of what they said, I've, I've gone back and renegotiated, but they'll say, well, look, we can't make this change for you. We've got hundreds of contracts. We can't just uh, change it for you. That would screw up our whole system. You know, we don't have the, the resources to track your particular property right. and say, hey, if your property comes up and, you know, for some reason it's, it's then, more than $200. Then you can take your business elsewhere. And the place I'd really like you to take your business is to self-management without a manager at all. See, there is a an inherent conflict of interest with property managers. You've heard me say this before. The conflict is that they're trying to serve two masters. And, you know, the rule in life is you can't serve two masters. You can either serve the investor, which is technically the obligation is to the investor, or you can serve the tenant. You can't serve both. So the property managers will be liberal in spending the investor's money as much as they can usually get away with it in order to make the tenant happy. Because you know what the tenants do? When they're unhappy, they go to Yelp and they start writing bad things about the property management company. And, you know, it's interesting. Whenever you hire a property manager, I want you to go to Yelp and read the reviews. Now, look, at we all know reviews are, a lot of them are false, okay? You know, they're false, good and bad, because their competitors, you know, will write bad reviews about them that are fake, and their employees will write good reviews that are fake too, <laughs> okay? So where is the truth? Nobody knows, okay? But it's probably somewhere in the middle. That's why you just have to not look at the star rating necessarily, but you have to actually read the things and see if they sound legit and just evaluate them with your brilliant human brain. You know, that's why we got these great brains. They work pretty well most of the time. And so that's one thing to do. But if the property manager has a bunch of bad reviews and they're from tenants, I don't know that that's necessarily the worst thing ever, right? If they're from investors, that is really bad. If there's a bunch of investors saying, oh, this property manager is terrible, you know, they, they ripped me off or this or that or the other thing, that I really get concerned about. If they got a, a bunch of bad reviews from tenants because they're a little more strict with the tenants, that doesn't necessarily bother me as much. We're complaining right now, but compared to what is the question? Compared to a Wall Street investment or some investment in some fund this is way better. At least here, you know what's going on and you have some control. Yes, when you're a direct investor with the plan that we outline, you're going to feel the bumps in the road. But you know what? At the end of the day, you're going to have a lot more money, okay? Because when you buy the mutual fund or the stock or invest in some fund that's buying apartment buildings or something, you don't feel the bumps. But guess what? Someone has taken all your money and you just don't even know about it, okay? Here, at least you can see it, right? And you can control it. So that's what we want you to do is become an empowered direct investor. You know, that's commandment number three, thou shalt maintain control. This is about being a direct investor and getting those higher yields because you're in control. I've got some property managers that like, I mean, literally years go by and there's not one deduction other than their management fee. I got others that, man, it's like every other month, there's this, that, this piddly thing, that piddly thing. You know what my mom, the do-it-yourselfer extraordinaire, you know, who's been on the show many times talking about her best practices, you know what she does? The tenants, she just gets the tenants to agree to fix stuff. When you're self-managing as a direct investor, you can actually talk to the tenant and you can set expectations and you can say, look, you are not living in a big institutional apartment complex where you're crammed together with a hundred neighbors, okay? This is your own home. It's a single family home. So, you know, I know that you don't own it, but think more like an owner. You've got to do a little maintenance here. You know, this is not a big institutional apartment. We're not going to send an exterminator out, you know, every week. We're not going to change your light bulbs for you. This is a home. I expect you to take pride in it and, you know, 
get involved and and take care of things. I've heard, yeah, I've, I've heard yeah. and this is what I'm about to say is probably not even legal, <laughs> but I'm going to say it anyway. But I've heard managers over the years, or not managers, but investors say to me things like, well, this is why I always ask them if they're handy. <laughs> You know, if they like to fix things, you know, uh, you know, like <laughs> it should almost be a test. You know, you give them a test. Well, do you know how to fix a sink? <laughs> you know, do you know how to unclog a drain? <laughs> you know, <laughs> actually, I don't think I don't think being unhandy or handy is actually a protected class yet under the fair housing rules. But it probably will be someday. <laughs> so. right. But, but the, so some of these property managers, you know, I, I know that the ones in Quad Cities, I think, they actually put out a video. They want these tenants, tenants. to watch the video yeah. on what they need to do so they don't come back and say, well, I didn't know I had to turn the, the main water off when I left or this and that. Some basic things, they, they actually had them uh, watch a video. So And then they have them sign off on it as well. So if there's any issues that, that comes up as a result of them, not having watched the video or not not having followed what the video instructed them to do, then they're held responsible. You know, I, getting back to your mother, I love your mother. You know, I spoke to her, you know, during the last uh, Meet the Masters. And, you know, she sets the expectations at the very beginning, and there's no fooling around with her. You know, you, she lets them know, hey, if I don't get the rent by the first, then I'm going to send you the, you know, the three-day notice. Yeah. So they don't fool around with somebody like that that sets the standards up the very, very first time that, you know, they don't pay the rent, then she just sends them a notice, you know, and then, so then from that point on, they take it very seriously. So that's why I'm saying, man, you were the property managers, you know, you just set the expectation. Hey, look, I'm watching my account. You know, I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, if you're right. going to deduct something, I need to know what it is. I agree. No, you, you need to do that. But I tell you, it just the more and more I do this and, you know, we've done thousands of deals. OK, I've been doing this a long, long time now. OK, you know, just in the uh, nationwide turnkey business. What what is it? Is it going? Well, it's almost 14 years, I think now. Right. And uh, or maybe it is 14 years in talking to thousands and thousands of investors. Just the more I think about it, the more I see it, the more I think that you just have this inherent conflict of interest with property managers. You just self-management more and more is the way to go. But, you know, if you have a good manager, it's great. But few managers are, are great, you know. I mean, some of them, you know, there's a continuum, right? There's, there are, some are okay, some are great, some are terrible. Okay, so Muthaya, now, just out of curiosity on the self-management thing, have you ever done it, considered it? How many properties do you have from us now? Well, I have about, uh, I think I have 20 properties right now. Hey, listeners, don't you love that Muthiah doesn't even know how many properties he has? That's cool. <laughs> you got so <laughs> many, you don't even know. <laughs> That's not true. How many do I, I have? I, I got about, I 20. about 20. Yeah. Well, I sold one, so I have 20 right now. Yeah, okay, okay. You had 21. Okay, got it. Okay, so Muthiah, did you self-manage any of them ever? No, no. Yeah. No, I didn't. You know what? Not these, but, you know, before I started investing, I, I owned a condo and I self managed at that point. That was many years ago, but you know I did that on my own and it wasn't that great. You know, the tenant would come up to my work and start screaming. You know, just one of those things. Yeah, but but see uh, see with this self <laughs> look, and I I self managed when I was a local investor. You know, I self managed everything. Okay. And then I self managed long distance, as I've told on the show before, you know, but I never had any tenants coming and screaming. I never had any calls at one in the morning. All of this folklore you hear, it just never happened to me. Okay. I did have this one guy. He was the funniest guy ever in the 90s. His name was Hugo, and he lived at my property in Rancho Santa Margarita. And he used to come in almost every month. He had his members only jacket on. The guy was just, he was just funny. And he'd come in every month and, he, hey, Jason, is Hugo? Uh, I'm sorry, the rent is late this month. He was late almost every month. <laughs> almost every month, you know, he'd come in. Uh, it's Hugo. And he always had an excuse. And he was just, the guy was just so funny. My assistants, Karen and Denise, used to see Hugo come into the office, you know, like it was always the fifth of the month. It was never the first. And, you know, he'd always hand me a check. But, you know, Oh, it was ultimately, it was fine. It's no big deal. Anyway, I'd consider self-management. But Muthaya, we want to get to the thing, of course, and it's my fault because I'm blabbering here. Let's talk about holding these people accountable. When you get a truly bad actor, and look at folks, I don't want you to think this happens all the time. It doesn't. Out of thousands and thousands of transactions, 
you only get a few of these, okay? But it's just the law of large numbers. You're going to get a few, okay? There, there are bad people out there. There are bad actors. There are people that will be good for a while, and then they become bad. They sort of take the relationship for granted. They, you know, the Napoleon, I always try to remind myself and humble myself with this great quote by Napoleon. You know, Napoleon finally met his Waterloo, right? <laughs> That's the story. That's how history tells it. And Napoleon used to say, the most dangerous moment comes with victory. The most dangerous moment comes with victory because we become complacent, we become arrogant, and we start missing things. And, you know, as humans, we must never do that. We're going to have victories in our life, and that's great, but we never, ever want to become complacent, okay? And that's what happens with these property managers. You know, they get busy, and they get successful, and, you know, they just forget to appreciate it. And it's just part of human nature. It's not a good thing. But it's a real thing, you know, and sometimes there are just some downright crooks out there, just some real scum, okay? And you got to hold them accountable. So what I did is I sent you my Hall of Shame resource list, which, by the way, any of you can get by going to jasonhartman.com and reaching out to your investment counselor. If you don't have an investment counselor, uh, just fill out any web form at jasonhartman.com and they'll get it to you. And, um, uh, you know, this is the list of agencies that you can simply file a complaint with for free, whether it be the real estate commission, you know, the contractor's license board, uh, different agencies, okay? And it's certainly by no means a comprehensive list, but it's a good start. And, you know, this is what you pay taxes for, folks. You've got these free government resources, these regulatory agencies, and I want you to use them. I want you to use them to file complaints against bad actors so that at the very least, maybe you won't get justice out of it, but you probably will. You probably will because they'll send them a letter, say, hey, look, a complaint's been filed against you. Fix it. That's what usually happens. And then when they don't fix it, they take the next step. They might suspend their license. They might sanction them. You know, the government has, you know, has unlimited power virtually, right? You know, maybe they won't pay attention to your complaint. You know, maybe it's the first one that came in about this bad actor. And maybe they got to accumulate a couple of complaints. But the, as that file grows and there's three complaints, four complaints, five complaints, you know, this regulatory agency is probably going to come down on them. And that's a good thing. And you know what? Even if it didn't help you directly, it helps the next person. Okay? So really, you know, become the empowered investor. Don't be a victim. And then the other thing you can do is an online court system like I referred you, Muthaya, to People Claim. I had them on right. the show, not on this show, but on my free court show. And I've got a similar passion project startup that I'm working on called Free Court. That's freecourt.com. You go check it out. It's an online court system. And people claim has been operational for quite a while now. You filed a complaint on people claim, and that's what did the trick. You did the administrative complaint with the regulatory agency also, right? Tell us about what right. you did and what happened. Well, I mean, I filed, based on your recommendation, I filed a complaint with the Alabama Real Estate Commission. And I, they didn't they do asked anything if, for you, yeah. Yeah, I know. They told me that they investigated it, and then they said that they already shut down the property management company that this is affiliated with this particular company, but they couldn't do anything to this company that sold me the property because they were operating under a different entity. It was not a real yeah. estate. Uh, it was not under the, under the guise of a real estate company, and so... They didn't have jurisdiction over them, and so that's why they couldn't do anything, but they did tell me... You know what we've got to do in this country, Muthaya? And look, folks, you're not going to like this because a lot of you ask about asset protection, and you've heard Garrett Sutton on the show talking about that and all that stuff. But I'll tell you something. We really need to, in this country, re-examine the way people are allowed to use entities to screw people over. (laughs) Because especially in the big corporate world with, you know, with these big wigs, I mean, it's just disgusting what they do. But anyway, that's a sort of another tangent, obviously. No, no, you know, this is a very valid point because you know what it is right after, even though they got twined and they got suspended, the property management company got suspended. These guys went back, changed the name of the company and be incorporated somewhere in some other state. And they continue to do business. And even in Alabama, they're still selling property in Alabama, yeah. but under another name. 
I mean, you know, they, it's just unbelievable. I know. It's people. Yeah, no, I know. It's a sad state of affairs, but anyway, it is what it is. Okay, so, but the thing that did work for you, though, you got some justice, and they actually, folks, the story ends with they actually bought the house back. I mean, that's a pretty big deal, okay? They actually took it back and gave you your money back, Muthaya. So, I'm being right. a spoiler there, but so Muthaya, what happened? So you you went to peopleclaim.com per my recommendation, and you you basically filed a case right in the online court, right? Yeah, and there were people that are offering to help me even through the people court. They kept saying, "Hey, how can we help you? Have you have you heard anything? Have they have they settled with you and so on?" And so I kept updating the complaint online, saying, "This is what's happened. They have not responded," and then I think from there, and they kept posting negative reviews on them. And I think eventually it got to them, and uh, they said, okay, look, we'll buy you back. And then I saw then at that point when they said, I'll buy, I said, I need to be made whole. Now, whatever I paid, I want you to pay me back. Plus, I need you to pay back the foundational damages that, that will cause is around $8,000. Right. Plus the, plus the closing cost on the buyback. So, I mean, over, after all of that, I think I was made pretty much the whole, and I got out of it. So that was, that was good. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, good. So it worked through people claim, but it might have worked through the regulatory agency. They did respond to you, and they did, on a separate matter, shut down their property management company. That wasn't because of your complaint, but it was because of someone else's complaint, right? Exactly. Good. Good. Exactly. Folks? And and they, they knew about this company. They knew about the reputation of this company. So they said we were familiar with this company. We shut them down because they had unlicensed agents yeah. leasing properties and making false promises. Exactly everything I said happened to me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so that was good. So I think that, like like you said, it it adds. You know, even though I didn't, you know, somebody else right. came in front of me and filed a complaint. You know, I came after them, and, and it just put more pressure on them to change their ways. It's a compounding thing, folks. Right. Do not be a victim. Be the empowered investor and do your duty. You know, Muthaya, you spent a lot of time on this, but I want to tell everybody, you do not need to spend a lot of time on it, okay? You can do this stuff. You can file a complaint with any one of these agencies on my list. Again, you want that list, jasonhartman.com. If you already have an investment counselor, just ask them for it. They'll get it to you. And, you know, do something. Hold these people accountable. I don't want to say... It's just for you. This is your duty as a citizen, okay? You know, it's like making a citizen's arrest when you see someone doing something bad, right? Or it's like that Seinfeld episode about the, uh, what do they call it, the uh, Good Samaritan Law? <laughs> you know, they, they went to jail on the last Seinfeld episode because you you have to be a Good Samaritan. You know, I think it's our duty. You got to do it, okay? You got to try and hold these people accountable and uh, make them do what's right, so. Uh, anything else people should know before we wrap it up, Mathia? I think that people should just not sit passively, whether it's, you know, when they're buying the property or when they're in dealing with the property manager or, you know, or the seller. They've just got to be actively involved at all times. I don't think it's, you know, you should sit back and just think everything's going to be fine. I think it's important to be an active participant. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm glad you got justice. And uh, folks... If you've been taken advantage of, this is what we're here for. Tell us so we can help you, so we can fight for you. We'll fight for you, as that commercial used to say with that lawyer. <laughs> I'll fight for you. <laughs> That's in L.A. See, it's where, where I grew up and you live, Muthaya. So I'll fight for you. Larry Parker got me $2.1 million. <laughs> You know, that guy supposedly has no legs. That's I, I don't think I'd sell my legs for $2.1 million, but adjusted for inflation, maybe it's better now. Anyway, I used to see that commercial when I was a kid. But folks, do not be a victim. Let us help you. We can provide resources. We can put pressure on these people. If someone's done you wrong, this is what we're here for. We're here to help you. And uh, that's, you know, one of the things we provide. Ongoing support for life. So reach out to us. If you have an investment counselor, jasonartman.com. If not, jasonartman.com. We'll get in touch with you there. And if you do have an investment counselor, just reach out directly. Muthaya, we've talked a lot about a lot of negative things today. Can we end with anything <laughs> positive? How do you like real estate investing? Is it good? 
<laughs> no, absolutely good. No, there are a lot of good property managers out there, a lot of good sellers out there. Just a few bad apples you got to filter out. That's all. You know, I mean, there, there's a lot of good people out there. Otherwise, uh, how would, you know, people continue to invest in these properties? There are some good people out there. You just need to find them. That's all. You sure. know? I mean, on your own podcast, people try to, you know, make it look like they're really good. You know, remember you said earlier that, hey, you know what? When, when people are hungry, they'll really do everything that they can to, uh, mm -hmm. to provide you the best quality service and everything else. But what happens is when they get nice and fat, they yeah. forget about you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's it's the most dangerous moment comes with victory. So keep them on their toes and don't let them get too fat. You know, this is actually one of the informal things that we do, okay, is that when we start to notice a provider becoming too busy or if they do something bad, like we, we had uh, another bad apple recently, and I don't know if he's a, you know, sometimes you got to judge it, like, on a deal by deal basis, some things can go wrong, right? It's not as important of what happens. It's more important, like how they handle it and what their attitude is about it, you know? And so when something happens, like, you know, it sort of reveals a person, okay? There's an old saying um, people are like tea bags. You don't know how strong they are until you put them in some hot water, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and so sometimes, you know, we, we notice that. And some of these people, you know, a thing goes wrong, and it's like we will just sever the relationship or we will just punish them and stop referring business for a while and put them in the penalty box. And, you know, this is what we are constantly evaluating. And this is why it really does take a human component. You know, you cannot do this with a website, okay? This is a high-touch, high-service business. That's just what's required because we got to be engaged with these people, make sure that we're holding them accountable. So anyway, you know, I, I really thank you for sharing your story. There are a lot of good people. This is the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. It is a great thing. Buy more properties. But, you know, when you have a problem now and then, you got to do something about it. And the goal of this talk with Muthaya was to empower you. So Muthaya, I, I thank you so much for sharing your story and coming on and helping other investors. That's, that's really great of you. And, you know, so many people listening have met you at our live events and they'll continue to do so. And uh, we hope to see you at some future live events. Okay. So thanks for joining us. Hey, it's, uh, thanks for your support, Jason. I appreciate yours and Carrie's support and your whole network. And it's really been very beneficial to me and, and a whole lot of others. I encourage everyone to use your resources that you have. But thanks, Jason. Well, thank you and happy investing, everyone. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.